Greetings and salutations. Hey besties. So I was originally going to do reading vlogs for the King Chronicles as my next reading vlog thing. But you know what? I really feel like reading the Demigod Diary. So we're going to do that first. I just had a really rough therapy session and you know what I need? My comfort characters. I need specifically my Percy and Annabeth going to Paris kind of content. And will the Diary of Liquid Salon really hurt me? Probably. But I just need this content. So we're reading the Demigod Diaries today. Come along. I may have a breakdown to the Diary of Liquid Salon. If I do, don't judge me for that. That's my truth. Can we appreciate that the Australian edition of this is a hardcover and isn't super ugly. Can we just appreciate that for a second? Dear young demigod, your destiny awaits. Now that you've discovered your true parentage, you must prepare yourself for a difficult future, fighting monsters, adventuring across the world and dealing with temperamental Greek and Roman gods. Rick needs to stop putting this shit in the books because my little child brain could not read this and then go on with my life. I was like, I am meant to be a demigod. I believe that this world is real because shit like this made me believe that the world was real and I need to be living in it. Why the fuck am I out here not being a demigod? What do you mean? Where's my fucking Seder? Over the years, many readers and campers at Camp Half-Blood have asked me to tell the story of Luke's early days, adventuring with Talia and Annabeth before they arrived at camp. I have been reluctant to do this as neither Annabeth nor Talia like to talk about those times. Ouch. I am gonna... If Lucas Allen wasn't already dead when I got my hands on him. I have always loved that Rick included a story that Haley wrote in this novel. That support for his son and his son growing up to write a story that was published in a Percy Jackson book considering that the story was created, like Percy's entire world was created as stories to be told to Haley to comfort him. Uh, and to make him feel represented and feel like he could be a hero. I love that this story was, these stories were created to bring Haley comfort and then they brought so much comfort to other people that Haley got to grow up and write a story that was in the world. I don't know, there's just something about that that I really, really love. Anyway, The Diary of Lee Castellan, let's do this. Opening up the, the Diary of Lee Castellan with My Name is Luke in a similar vein to in the beginning of The Lightning Thief, we have Percy literally, I think, say, my name is Percy Jackson, I'm a troubled kid, yeah, you could say that. All of that, it immediately draws that parallel between the two of them, which I think is quite masterful, but also, like, I hate, I know that there are a lot of parallels between Luke and Percy, and the difference is kind of just, like, Percy has very similar experiences to Luke, but goes down a much better path. Percy is a much better person, and he chooses not to make the same mistakes as their parents, whereas Luke goes down the path of revenge and making those same mistakes. As his parents, he is more easily manipulated by Kronos because he desires revenge rather than just desiring a greater world for the, the sake of it being a greater world. Luke is driven more out of vengeance than Percy is. But I like having having that parallel there is really, really, it's smart and it's, it's masterful the way that Rick has done that, even in just that little moment. But mm, mm, I have feelings. I imagined all the normal families living in those cozy houses. I wondered what it would be like to have a home, to know where my next meal was coming from and not have to worry about getting eaten by monsters every day. Funny, if you wonder so much about what having a normal family was like, maybe you should have protected the found family you had more rather than betraying them all rather than betraying the one place that accepted you and called you home you did not have to fucking have a family with homies but you could have made a family at camp and protected that family and you luke chose not to do that and i hate you is the goat a symbol of they're about to meet annabeth or does something else happen that i don't remember that's really really important i like to think it's that they're about to meet annabeth <laughs> I took a step back, resisting the urge to grab my weapon. Oh, by the way, my weapon was a golf club. Feel free to laugh. Bestie, I ain't gonna laugh. I've seen Blank Space, both the music video ended on tour. I know the damage a golf club can do. And other news, tell us if please hit me in the face with your golf club. I screamed that at her in the 1989 tour. We're not gonna talk about it. I am Hal Halcyon Green? I don't know if that's how to pronounce his name, but I am Halcyon Green. I'm terribly sorry, but you are in the cage. You've been lured here to die. That was quite clear, honestly, guys. I'm not gonna lie to you. That was pretty obvious. Do you know why that's such a shock? It has a talent for imitating human voices. That is how it lures its prey. Why do Luke and Talia always get themselves in situations where there's some creature that is mimicking human voices to lure its prey? This is not the only time it happens to them. G guys. Notice just in the way that Luke and Talia respond to Hal's curse that, like, Luke is just really angry and he's not even necessarily saying like, we'll help you. He's saying you should fight back. You didn't deserve this. Break out, kill the monsters because the gods had wronged by you. Whereas like 
Talia is just coming from like, we'll fight the monsters with you, we can help you. They're both understanding that the gods did something wrong, yet Luke is a lot angrier. Luke's immediate response is anger and to just take that anger out on something, whereas Talia just kind of wants to help more so. Because obviously what the gods did is wrong. Hal helped and saved someone. The gods cursing him for that is wrong. Like no one disagrees with Luke, I don't think, in any of the conversations that I've had about his character, that he was right about the gods being bad people. The gods should realistically be overthrown. They're cruel and they don't understand humanity with the exception of Apollo now. And they should be, they should not be in charge anymore. They should not have the power over mortal lives that they do. However, Luke goes about it in the wrong way. Luke gets so clouded um, by anger and bitterness that he hurts other people in the process of him trying to overthrow the gods. And that makes, that, that means that he's no better than them. Listen, I'm not gonna lie, when I was younger, I kind of liked the Luke Talia ship. I kind of did. I don't anymore because I just have this deep dislike of Luke Castellan and I actually quite like Talia and I don't like the betrayal. I don't like where they lead. I don't like them as a ship. I don't like shipping Luke with anyone because I don't wish that upon anyone. But I didn't remember anything in canon kind of hinting at them actually having feelings for each other. But Talia kissed me on the cheek, which you probably shouldn't have done when I was holding a tube of deadly poison. You are so good, she said. Did that make the risk worth it? Yeah, pretty much. That sounds kind of flirty. That sounds a bit like Luke has feelings for Talia and I don't love that. I didn't think there was anything in canon that actually supported that ship. Someday soon you'll sacrifice yourself to save your friends. I see things that are hard to describe. Years of solitude. It will stand tall and still, alive but sleeping. It will change once and then change again. Your path will be sad and lonely, but someday you will find your family again. Until that family gets, spoilers for Charles of Apollo, until that family gets killed. And then I guess you have a family with the Hunters and with Annabeth, but still, I'm upset. A betrayal, Talia said. Her tone was dangerous. You mean someone betrays Luke? Because. Luke would never betray anyone. Alexa, play Traitor by Olivia Rodrigo. You can control lightning? Sometimes, Tali admitted. It's a Zeus thing, but I can't do it indoors. And even if we were outside, I'd have trouble controlling the strike. Last time I almost killed Luke. Wish you did. How really should have given both the diary and the dagger to someone who deserved it more. The dagger made its way to someone who deserved it, deserved that protection from it, but... I should have given the diary to someone who deserved it more because Luke didn't learn from any of his mistakes. I mean, maybe in his final moments, but that doesn't fucking erase everything else. Oh, you right, you need fellows of us. He scribbled something and handed me the diary. The last word read, promise. Ouch. As soon as I lifted the sheet of tin, something flew at me, a blur of flannel and blonde hair. A hammer hurtled straight at my face. I love that Annabeth's first interaction with Lucas Ellen was trying to hit him with a hammer. Bestie, I wish you kept that energy your whole goddamn life. Hey, hey, little girl, she said, sounding more gentle than I'd ever heard. It's all right. We're not going to hurt you. I'm Talia. This is Luke. Monsters, she wailed. No, I promised. The poor thing wasn't fighting as hard, but she was shivering like crazy, terrified of us. But we know about monsters, I said. We fight them too. I held her, more to comfort than restrain now. Eventually, she stopped kicking. She felt cold. Her ribs were bony under her flannel pajamas. I wondered how long this little girl had gone without eating. She was even younger than I had been when I ran away. Despite her fear, she looked at me with large eyes. They were startlingly grey, beautiful and intelligent. A demigod, no doubt about it. I got the feeling she was powerful, or she would be if she survived. You're like me? She asked, still suspicious, but she sounded a little hopeful too. Yeah, I promised. We're... I hesitated, not sure if she understood what she was or if she'd ever heard the word demigod. I didn't want to scare her even more. Well, it's hard to explain, but we're monster fighters. Where's your family? The little girl's expression turned hard and angry. Her chin trembled. My family hates me. They don't want me. I ran away. My heart felt like it was cracking into pieces. She had such pain in her voice, familiar pain. I looked at Talia and we made a silent decision right there. We would take care of this kid. 
This fills me with such fucking rage because how dare you? How dare you have felt this way about Annabeth and then gone and betrayed her in the way that you did? How dare you fucking force her to hold up this sky and almost kill her time and time again and betray every ounce of trust she had on you and manipulate her and fucking grow feelings for this little fucking girl that you found and wanted to protect? How dare you? I hate Luke so much. I tell you what, Annabeth, you're pretty fierce. I could use a fighter like you. Her eyes widened. You could? Oh yeah, I said earnestly. Then a sudden thought struck me. I reached for Hal's dagger and pulled it from my belt. It will protect its owner, Hal had said. He had got it from the little girl he had saved. Now fate had given us a chance to save another little girl. I hate Luke so much. Knives are only for the bravest and quickest fighters, I told her. My voice caught as I remembered Hal and how he died to save us. They don't have the reach or power of a sword, but they're easy to conceal and they can find weak spots in your enemy's armor. It takes a clever warrior to use a knife. I have a feeling you're pretty clever. Annabeth beamed at me, and for that instant, all my problems seemed to melt. I felt as if I'd done one thing right. I swore to myself I would never let this girl come to harm. <sighs> Annabeth's smile wavered. For a moment, she got that wild look in her eyes again. You're... You're not going to take me back to my family. <laughs> Promise? I swallowed the lump out of my throat. Annabeth was so young, but she'd learned a hard lesson just like Tyler and I had. Our parents had failed us. The gods were harsh and cruel and aloof. Demigods had only each other. I put my hand on Annabeth's shoulder. You're part of our family now, and I promise you I'm not going to fail you like our families did us. Deal? Deal, she said happily, clutching her new dagger. Imagine if Luke had kept his fucking promise. Annabeth deserved so much better. And I bet just deserved so much more than she got. Jesus Christ. All right, Percy Jackson and the staff of Hermes, let's go. Ah, some serotonin after that. It's needed. It didn't help my concentration that Annabeth looked so good today. She was wearing her regular orange camp t-shirt and shorts, but her tanned arms and legs seemed to glow in the sunlight. Her blonde hair swept over her shoulders. Around her neck hung a leather cord with colorful beads from a demigod training camp, Camp Half-Blood. Her strong gray eyes were as dazzling as ever. I just wish that the fierce look wasn't directed at me. Percy Jackson constantly getting distracted by how hot Annabeth is is such a mood. I love this simp so much. Honestly, what well, Annabeth deserves. She tucked her legs underneath her. Percy, I, I love the picnic, really. But you promised to take me out for a special dinner tonight, <laughs> remember? It's not that I expect it, but you said you had something planned, so... I could hear hopefulness in her voice, but also doubt. The doubt doesn't come from Percy being a bad boyfriend, which he assumes that it does, but the doubt just comes from Annabeth being so used to being let down by people she cares about, even though she trusts Percy and she doesn't kind of associate Percy with the people that have hurt her, which is a huge step for her and I love that for her. I'm very proud of her. She just is kind of used to people letting her down and I know that Percy takes that personally, which breaks my heart, but also the fact that Annabeth has to expect that from people breaks my heart and mm, my babies. Just because I forgot, you shouldn't take that as a sign I didn't care about Annabeth. Seriously, the last month with her had been awesome. I was the luckiest demigod ever. But special dinner. When had I mentioned that? Maybe I'd said it after Annabeth kissed me, which had sort of sent me into a fog. Big mood, buddy. Big mood. I love a simp. I didn't lose it, Hermes snapped. It was stolen. And I wasn't asking for your help, girl. Fine, she said. Solve your own problem. Come on, Percy. Let's get out of here. I love her. I love her. Fuck you, Hermes. Literally still blaming Annabeth for just something that was not at all in her own hands. Like, Hermes kind of had a little redemption in The Last Olympian with how he was treating Annabeth and blaming her for what happened with Luke. Yet here, he's just being a fucking asshole to her again. So, Hermes, you're on thin fucking ice with me, man. A little background. Annabeth used to adventure with Hermes and Luke. Over time, Annabeth developed a crush on Luke. As Annabeth got older, Luke developed feelings for her too. Luke turned evil, Hermes blamed Annabeth for not preventing Luke from turning evil. Annabeth blamed Hermes for being a rotten dad and giving Luke the capacity to become evil in the first place. Luke died in war, Hermes and Annabeth blamed each other. Confused? Welcome to my world. First of all, Annabeth kind of has a point of blaming Hermes. Again, it's more so Luke doing his own actions. They shouldn't be blaming either of them. Luke made his own choices. Luke was an adult when he died. He was making his own choices. Luke was my age when Cronus first started manipulating him. Like, I like to think that I'm enough of an adult where I wouldn't fall for that type of manipulation. I'm a very easily manipulated person, but 
not by people that inherently evil. I like to think I'd be smart enough for that. Luke was old enough to be held accountable for his own actions. However, I understand from Anna's point of view where she's still a child, she's still 16 with this idealized version of Luke in her brain and she's still coming to terms with all of the manipulation that Luke, you know, made her subject to. I can see why Annabeth would want to blame Hermes. Hermes is an immortal fucking being. He should not be blaming Annabeth. Also, mm, can I prove that Luke had feelings for Annabeth too? I like that it, you know, justifies all of the content I make about Luke being gross and weird and me hating him for being essentially a little bit of a groomer. But don't... Uh, it also makes me deeply uncomfy. Oh, he's a giant. Hermes said dismissively. A small giant, not one of the big ones. A small giant. Yes, maybe 10 feet tall. Tiny, then. I agreed. I love him. I love Percy so much. Now, you're going to explain to me why you, a super powerful god, can't just go get your stuff back yourself and why you need me, a 16-year-old kid, to do it for you. Annabeth made a small gagging sound. It's the ginger giant. Unfortunately, the giant had extremely good hearing. He frowned and scanned the cabin, zeroing in on our hiding place. Who's there? He bellowed. You, behind the bulldozer. Annabeth and I looked at each other. She mouthed, oops. Can we get rid of the like narrative and the presumption that Annabeth just never does anything wrong, that she's too intelligent to ever make mistakes or be impulsive or like be an idiot? Because Annabeth is such an idiot sometimes. Annabeth is such an idiot sometimes. Let her be a bit of an idiot sometimes. That does not take away from her intelligence. It does not take away from her being an Athena kid. It doesn't negate any of that. Everyone is stupid sometimes. Annabeth is impulsive and chaotic and sometimes a bit of an idiot. Let's embrace that part of her. I love that aspect about her. Appreciate it. I stepped forward. Call me old fashioned, but I wanted to keep his focus on me and not Annabeth. I think it's polite for a guy to protect his girlfriend from an instant incineration. I agree, Percy, light of my life. The blueprint, the blueprint for all men. Who's gonna protect me from instant incineration? No one? Seems about right. Annabeth raised her knife. Did he just call me Hermes kids? I'm going to stab him in that. I'm Percy Jackson, son of Poseidon. I love Annabeth. Oh my God, I love Annabeth so much. You're probably thinking, wait, you just charged in without a plan, but Annabeth and I had been fighting together for years. We knew each other's abilities. We could anticipate each other's moves. I might've felt awkward and nervous about being a boyfriend, but fighting with her, that came naturally. That sounded wrong. Oh well. That's what I love about Percy about this. Even when they are like awkward 15, 16 year olds trying to figure out how they work in a relationship and how to be a how to be boyfriend and girlfriend in general, they still have the the same care and because they, you know, were friends for so long before and they're essentially each other's family already at this point. They know each other so well that even though they can fumble around their relationship, they still work together as a team so flawlessly and I love that so much. She was beautiful in combat. I know that's a crazy thing to say, especially after we just climbed a sewage waterfall, but her grey eyes sparkled when she was fighting for her life. Her face shone like a goddess's, and believe me, I'm seeing goddesses. The way her chem half her bees rested against her throat. Okay, sorry, got a little distracted. I simply love a simp. Oh my god, I love this simp. I love this simp. I love him so much. I love Percy so much. He is so in love with Annabeth. I love him so much. Percy, you know I rocket grab her arm games. That was true. I'd taken her to the arcade at Coney Island and would come back with a sack full of stuffed animals. I guess she did win him the arcade ring. <laughs> her name is Annabeth, I said, and she's one of a kind. That was peak romance to me reading this as a kid. I may not see you for a while, Percy, Hermes warned, but well, enjoy tonight. He made that sound so ominous I wanted again what he wasn't telling me. I hate that all the gods fucking knew about, or at least some of the gods knew about Hera's plan and none of them fucking did anything. None of them were like, this is a bad idea. There are probably other ways to go about this where you don't fuck up their lives so bad. Mm. Hopefully I looked okay because Annabeth looked stunning. She wore a dark green sleeveless dress that showed off her long blonde hair and a slim athletic figure. Her cam necklace had been replaced by a string of grey pearls that matched her eyes. I can't believe that Percy Jackson took Annabeth Chase for their one month anniversary to the fucking Eiffel Tower. Like he took her to Paris with a view of the Eiffel Tower for dinner for their one month anniversary. See, real men just cannot live up to fictional men. Carrie Kate Fletcher was fucking right when she said the boys in books are better. Also, I didn't even like realize this at the time, but Annabeth Chase, like the one time we kind of hear her like being really, really dressed up formally, her wearing like a dark green sleeveless dress. Mine wasn't sleeveless, but I wore like a dark green dress to my high school formal with like spaghetti straps, so kind of sleeveless. I'll put a picture here if I can find one. The Annabeth Chase vibes, maybe, maybe I was channeling my inner Annabeth. I would like to think I was, maybe. I wasn't wearing grey pearls, but I was wearing the infinity stones on my hand. 
Got to count for something? I'd survived a month as Annabeth's boyfriend, so I guess I hadn't screwed things up too badly. In fact, I'd never been happier. If she saw a future for us, if she was still planning to be with me next month, then that was good enough for me. You'll mind if I just cry for like a couple good, a good few hours, maybe. I want to explore Paris with a beautiful girl. All right, Leo Battle is in the quest for Buford. Let's fucking go and origin for my favorite little table man. I, I got careless. I polished him with Windex and he ran away. Jason looked like he was trying to figure out an equation. Let me get this straight. Your table ran away because you polished him with Windex? I know, I'm an idiot, Leo moaned. A brilliant idiot, but still an idiot. Buford hates being polished with Windex. He has to be lemon pledged with extra moisturizing formula. I was distracted. I just thought maybe once he wouldn't notice. Then I turned around for a while to install the combustion tubes and when I looked for Buford, he was gone. I love that Leo knows what Buford likes to be polished with. I also love that Buford is like sentient enough to be like, I hate, I hate Windex. I will scurry off into the night. I completely forgot that this was a Christmas story. Someone remind me to read this on Christmas Eve. Piper being so gentle and like reassuring with the naiad while Jason's like being an idiot about it. You can tell that she's sapphic. You can tell that she's sapphic. I'm fairly sure this is the only mention we really get of the battle that happens in Battle of the Labyrinth besides in Battle of the Labyrinth or probably the last Olympian. I can't remember, but I assume they reference it at least there. And it's kind of nice to think that with the exception of Leo, because he's very, very busy building the Argo 2 to the point where he misses out on a lot of social events and just normal camp stuff, that that battle is remembered and the, the lives that were lost and the impact of that is taught to new campers. Neither Piper nor Jason were there, but they, they know exactly what it is when they walked into that clearing. They knew what Zeus's fist was, even though it doesn't look like Zeus's fist anymore. And they knew that it led to the labyrinth. And I just like the idea that those things aren't lost at camp. Those memories aren't lost at camp. People remember them and the sacrifices that were made and the fights that were had and the battles that were had. They are remembered and they are taught to new campers. I just really like that. Honestly, I wouldn't be mad if a bunch of like drunk dancing nymphs tore me to shreds. I give you permission. All right, not an awful way to go. There are worse ways to go. Where else would I get a view like this? Stop, Leo. Piper's charm speak saved him, freezing him in place. It's the madness of Dionysus affecting you. You don't want to die. Wish I could relate. It always makes me sad how much Leo blames himself for things. Like I understand in some ways this was his fault. Like the bunker nearly exploding was his fault, but the plan getting complicated, the nymphs getting involved and keeping them from finding Buford sooner and just him being so preoccupied trying to build a ship that is going to take them on this quest that's going to save the world is a good enough distraction to make a little error. And like, I hate how much he carries the guilt of his, his even near mistakes, because nothing happened here, but his mistakes and his near mistakes, how, how heavy he feels them all. It makes me sad. Like he's like a kid. It's okay, buddy. I just want to give him a hug. I just want to give him a hug. All right, it got dark and I had dinner, but we're now back and we're gonna do some of magic. Let's go. But first, a note from Rick Riordan. Percy Jackson began as a bedtime story for my son, Haley. In the spring of 2002, when Haley was in first grade, he began having trouble at school. We soon found out he had ADHD and dyslexia. Over the years, Haley and Percy have grown up together. Percy became a hero. Haley did some pretty heroic things too. He learned to overcome his learning disabilities, excelled in school, became a voracious reader, and much to my own astonishment, decided he wanted to write books of his own. I asked Haley if he'd like to contribute a story to Demigod Diaries. He immediately took up the challenge. The result is Son of Magic, in which Haley carves out new territory in Percy's world. It seems only fitting that Haley and I have come full circle. It's my pleasure to introduce Son of Magic, the debut story from Haley Ride, and why am I about to cry? I love that this kid, whoever he may be, the, the, the fan of Mr. Claymore, just completely was like, I'm not going to let you make a fool out of me in front of all these people. You think you can embarrass me in front of everyone? You think that's part of your showman act? Mm -mm. I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you why you're expecting us to give you answers that you spent your entire career searching for. Shouldn't you have the answers? 10 out of 10 show stopping, as you fucking should. Please try, Dr. Claymore, because if you don't, I'm going to die. That's a bit heavy to put on a stranger. That's a bit much to put on a stranger. A bit of pressure. Oh, 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 oh. Dr. Claymore's an asshole, but I kind of don't envy being put in that position. 
can we just talk about how talented of a writer Haley is at 16 years of age? I could not write something this good at 16. I had things on the inter- I have fan fictions on the internet that I published, uh... I definitely have one third I put up when I was- that I, like, wrote when I was 15. I don't know about 16, but they were nowhere fucking near this good. Jesus. What a talent. We love to see it. Claymore shivered. He felt a strange urge to warn the child, but no, this wasn't his problem. Mm, you should warn the child, buddy. Oh my god. It's actually really interesting to me that Hecate decided and said, and obviously it was true then, that the most probable outcome was Kronos winning, because I always assumed that it, there's no set thing. The prophecy was the prophecy. There was two very clear options, and I didn't necessarily feel that one was more likely than the other in terms of what the gods knew, but if I would have made a guess, I would have guessed that just looking at the prophecy, the more likely thing was that the heroes would win. It's very genuinely interesting to me that even Hecate was like, no, 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 the more probable thing was Kronos winning. I had no memory of Black being killed in this. That's really upset me. That has like the same energy as Cedric, just a complete lack of care for a real person's life because they just got in the way of um, an important vengeful figure going after a main character kind of thing. Oh, that is upsetting. That's upsetting to me. Do you think Hazel would be powerful enough now to create a mist form? Because I reckon she could if she tried, if she knew that that was a thing. I reckon she fully could. It's better not to imagine them as gods. The best way to think of them is more like a divine mafia. Honestly, really accurate. Kind of love that. Gonna use that. Gonna steal that and use that when talking about these books. God damn. Couldn't remember if she was officially working for Gaia, but kind of spelled, but now my mistress has risen. Yeah, this bitch is working for Gaia. I get really tired of them because, like, I just reread Lot of Olympus recently and I'm like, it's so disappointing. I don't care. Hera is the monster. She destroys all the women her husband falls in love with. She hunts down their offspring out of jealousy and spite. She killed my children. She's got some points there. She is speaking straight facts. Honestly, um, yeah, Hera is a monster. Retweet. It's a really interesting commentary how Claymore is talking about when he dies and gets to the river sticks. Um, how he he died doing a heroic thing and a good thing, but because of who he saved and the god's relationship and bias towards that one person, rather than him having died to save another, it will be looked at as if he was just helping a traitor. And I think that's really true in talking about the way that the gods just do have biases and the way that their, their system, not even just in the afterlife, but how they treat everyone below them, every mortal, every minor god, everyone, is that there's no fairness, there's no justice, there's no actual morality or scale around what is a heroic act and what is actively like you know what actually gets you into elysium or the fields or whatever like it is just based on the god's biases i would like to think that people were biased against lucas stellan so that he didn't get to elysium even though Oliver said he would because i don't think he deserved elysium but he might be there purely because they were biased which pains me that was a really sweet ending to the book and honestly just, I really want to praise Hayley Ryden's just intense, insane talent as a writer because that was my favourite short story in here, if I'm being honest. And I remember as a kid finding it a little bit boring because my favourite thing when I first read these, these companion novels when I was 10 or 11 was that they were extra stories about the characters I loved. And so having a bunch of new characters that weren't really kept that connected to the main story wasn't my favorite thing but now as someone who craves just knowing all of the lore and every every piece of media that I consume and just loving like world building and all of that extent of things and seeing kind of other people existing in the worlds that I love and how they deal with the, those things and cope with those worlds it was really really interesting to have that perspective and I just enjoyed the writing style a lot and I think that was my favorite short story which I wasn't expecting yay anyway thanks for watching I hope that this was somewhat enjoyable and fun I should hopefully depending on how my mental health goes start working on the Ken Chronicles reading vlogs relatively soon the reason why I haven't started it yet is because I just haven't been doing the best in my head and like long book reading vlogs take a long time to create it feels kind of overwhelming but hopefully I'll start working on that soon for you so yeah thank you so much for watching I love you very much and I will see you soon Mwah!